Hello, everybody. Um, we'll start the webinar in a minute. Just a few more people are arriving. I'll just wait till the, the count number stops uh, going up quickly. But at the moment, we've got 45 people and it's still climbing a little bit. OK, so hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. It's been organised by the Process Industries Division of IMECI. It's one of a series of webinars and seminars exploring the many evolving techniques of condition monitoring. As we know, condition monitoring is becoming easier to use and we're able to collect more data than ever before. But how can we best make use of that data to optimise decision making? How can we balance efficiency with complexity? but also optimising costs for, for maintenance and, and operations. In this talk, uh, Robert, uh, Dr. Robert Kolker will illustrate how current condition monitoring techniques can be effectively applied in an improved asset integrity framework, in particular using digital twins. Rob's experienced in modelling, simulation and data analysis. He uses digital tools to help his clients in a wide variety of industries to solve complex um, engineering challenges, technical scientific challenges. At the end of the talk, Rob will be joined by Simon Lewis <coughs> and Thanos Moros so that we can jointly discuss any aspects of the talk and answer your questions. So please submit any questions you've got in the chat or the Q&A. Also, uh, if you're interested in future topics, feel free to give us some suggestions or even volunteer to help with that. And at the end of the um, of this webinar, there'll be some slides with emails for, for feedback as well. So a little bit of housekeeping. The event is being recorded. It will uh, eventually appear in the Process Injuries Division YouTube playlists. Because of the number of people, we've uh, stop cameras and, and muted people. So you'll have to use uh, the, the Q&A and chats. Sorry about that. I already asked uh, Robert and he's happy to share the slides um, on individual request if anybody wants those at the end of that. So with that, um, I'll stop talking and I'll hand over to Robert Kolker. Thanks, Richard. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for Thanks for joining in with this webinar. Um, so yeah, Richard Gray gave a, a nice introduction there to what, what this webinar is going to be about. And I'm going to be focusing on um, optimizing plant integrity management um, using data from condition monitoring, uh, specifically track the sort of more real-time condition monitoring techniques that we have available to us nowadays um, that can get us a lot of data. How can we use that data? If we're gathering all this data, can we actually find a good use for it um, uh, and make sure that we're best uh, and effectively uh, managing our assets using that data? Um, thanks, Richard. We'll move on. Um, so just a very, very brief summary of myself, Richard already introduced me, but yes, my, my experience is, um, is, is around 20 years experience in, in a range of different industry sectors um, with asset integrity management type problems, um, structural analysis, supported by mechanical, uh, mechanical testing, um, numerical modeling, uh, engineering judgment um, to support safety case development and asset integrity management. Um, so yeah, my, that's that's been my, my my main background with a focus on sort of damage mechanisms like fatigue and fracture um, in, a, in a range of sort of very high pressure, high temperature assets across many different industry sectors. Um, I work at a company called Element Digital Engineering. Um, so if we look on the next slide, Element Digital Engineering is a, a 
is effectively uh, the engineering consultancy arm of Element Materials Technology. Um, some of you may be familiar with that organisation. Uh, Element is a is a large organisation, global organisation that has uh, several thousand experts across the globe, um, and, and primarily involved in mechanical testing, inspection, and certification. But Element Digital Engineering are focused on looking at trying to use numerical analysis, digital techniques, modeling and simulation to be able to um, solve design, operational safety challenges um, in, in very high risk, high hazard uh, industries and applications. Um, so we're primarily focused in the UK um, and there's a, a, over a hundred of us um, uh, with a range of expertise in data science, engineering analysis, uh, inspection, certification and safety analysis. Thanks, Richard. Um, and just broadly, what is Element Digital Engineering focused on? Um, we're really complementing what Element are trying to do in terms of um, certification of, of products across many different industry sectors by supporting that process with uh, digital engineering techniques. So whether that be modeling and simulation um, at the design stage to try and optimize a design, uh, whether it be uh, in service um, operation of a component, um, or whether it be towards the end of life, um, uh, whether it be life extension, decommissioning um, challenges and so on, we use numerical modeling, simulation, um, digital techniques to be able to help inform decision making. Thanks, Richard. So, broadly, what I'm going to talk about today is um, how we might use condition monitoring data, um, all the data that we can gather uh, through the various techniques, to be able to support um, what I've termed here in this in this presentation as component passporting, material passporting. Um, how we might uh, use that data to help us make decisions. Um, about whether materials in our equipment are degrading, how they will respond um, throughout their life to all the different types of loads um, that are um, they are subject to, and if we can use that data to make decisions about whether the components and the assets that we've got will be safe, uh, and potentially could they be reused in future um, once they've been dismantled and decommissioned, um, and uh, somewhat, a, a bit about um, simulation and also um, constructing digital twins of um, components and assets that can be used to support that decision making. So material passporting then. Um, this is really all about how we can construct what I've called component, material and component passports here um, in safety critical industries. And this is really about, uh, if you imagine a passport, it provides very sort of um, a simple information about a, a particular, um, in, in terms of a, a, sort of a travel passport, it provides the, the very basic information needed for you to, to, to travel um, in terms of a material or component passport. Um, this is a, um, a, a concept where very basic, uh, easy to understand information is provided about a material or component um, that's informed by a very rigorous um, engineering analysis and understanding, but it provides a very quick and easy to understand um, uh, decision um, uh, and tool for deciding how a particular material or subset of a component might be able to be used in future, and whether it's in operation or for future reuse. Thanks, Richard. So, the benefits of having such things as materials and component passports, um, they're, they're really helpful in giving us that additional knowledge um, regarding whether materials continue to be useful in service, um, whether they've degraded um, and have become dangerous to use um, because the de degradation is actually taking the resistances of materials in our components down to such a level as to that they're, they're no longer safe 
or they're no longer um, operationally applicable anymore. Can we take those materials or components from an assembly out and use them elsewhere, perhaps in a different environment, perhaps in, under different operating conditions, uh, perhaps retrofit them into different assemblies? Um, have they seen a level of damage uh, which is low enough to allow us to be able to do that? So building up this um, large data set uh, of what the material and the components have seen over their lifetime through condition monitoring data, um, whether that be temperatures, vibrations, strains, and so on, um, is really useful to help inform that decision-making process. So passporting is really useful if we get accurate and de detailed data from our condition monitoring techniques. Um, it's going to summarize for us in a very easy to understand way the state of the materials that we have in our components. Um, and that gives us confidence in, in being able to reuse them, especially where we've got very safety critical um, uh, components in, in very high risk uh, systems in industry. Um, we want to make sure that there really is very limited risk of um, things going wrong and components failing because of uh, excessive material degradation. Thanks. So the data that we can gather uh, to incorporate into this passporting um, can relate to a range of different attributes about the system and the operation and the environment in which it's working. Um, not just specific uh, key mechanical inputs like vibrations, strains, temperatures, and so on, but it could also be a record of uh, the levels and the types and the frequency of maintenance that the component's seen, um, what environments um, the component's been operating in over its lifetime, uh, a record of um, temperatures, uh, and, and exposure and, and so on, uh, as well as other things um, such as perhaps the, the, the local aesthetics and um, even more qualitative data. If images have been taken, photographs have been taken, those can be attributed to the, the passport of a particular component and used overall in the overall decision making. So what's, what's most important out of all of this data and that's collected is to be able to very accurately build up a picture as to how much damage has been accumulated into that component. Um, so whether that be fatigue damage, um, whether it be creep, um, whether it be cracking, corrosion damage, whatever type of damage is relevant for a particular component in a particular um, operating environment, we want to be able to help ourselves make appropriate decisions as to whether we can continue to use that component as is. Uh, maybe we need to modify the operational uh, conditions, the, the exposure environment, um, or maybe we need to consider how, if we were to reuse this component or assembly somewhere else in a different environment, would the residual damage in that component um, be um, too much for that new environment? So. There's a lot of data that we can collect and there's a lot of decisions that could be taken and they are uh, going to be highly dependent on all of the different variables of um, the existing or the new operation. Um, so there's a lot to understand um, and potentially a lot of engineering decisions to be made. So the data that we collect needs to be accessible. Um, we need to have a way of standardizing it. And we also need to make sure that it is unambiguous um, with as little uncertainty as to the data uh, meaning as possible. So it's really important that we have systems set up to make sure that we uh, have very standardized approaches for collecting and visualizing that data. Thanks. So just, just introducing an example as to where these types of techniques can come in very useful. Um, and then I'll go, go into, come into this example in a bit more detail a bit later on in the, in the presentation. So just imagine a, a shell and tube heat exchanger um, that's got a, a number of different parts in it. It's got the, the main cylindrical shell, uh, the ends of the heat exchanger, the, the, the tube, the tube bundle, um, any baffles that are in there in the heat exchanger, the tube sheet portion, um, any supports, um, any attachments, including inlet and outlet nozzles. So there's a whole array of different component parts that go into uh, a very, what could be a very simple heat exchanger. And each of those will see um, different exposure to stresses, strains, temperatures, 
um, fatigue damage, um, potential for cracking, and uh, etc. throughout its life. So, is it possible that, firstly, we may have a particular design life for this heat exchanger, um, and we this heat exchanger has been in service for quite some time now? Can we make uh, an accurate decision based on what we've collected through, throughout its lifetime? in terms of condition monitoring, can we make a, a good evaluation as to whether the damage that's been experienced by the heat exchanger has um, actually been a lot less than we had originally expected um, in the original design? Um, if we don't want to use the heat exchanger um, wholesale and continue its life uh, in its current application, can we actually remove some elements of the heat exchanger? Uh, perhaps the tube bundle um, hasn't corroded as much as we thought it would have uh, perhaps the uh, the nozzles haven't seen as much um, in, in, in terms of potential for fatigue damage and so on, and they, they could be potentially removed and cut out of, of the shell and, and transposed somewhere else. So can we very accurately quantify the levels of damage, whatever that damage might be, um, using condition monitoring data uh, and then allow ourselves the, the possibility to reuse parts elsewhere um, because obviously with um, with the need to try to keep costs down uh, in industry and the, the ability to salvage materials and components as well as the environmental impact of scrapping materials um, that are, are actually fine to reuse again potentially in different applications so there is a strong desire to get the most out of materials and components that we can thanks So this next little section is just thinking a little bit about in more detail about, about damage that our components might experience and how that those the damage that those materials might experience, how might that affect our decision making as to where those materials get reused. Thanks. So I mentioned already that the, the, the main um, engineering materials in service for a lot of um, safety critical applications tend to be engineering metals um, and the damage mechanisms that those tend to experience the most that could potentially lead to failures in lifetime are fatigue, creep, corrosion and cracking or some combination of those. And those damage mechanisms some of them are easier to detect and characterize than others. There's a whole range of different um, inspection uh, techniques that can be used to try to find these types of damage mechanisms. Um, cracking uh, can be quite easy to find, and once the cracking extends to quite a, uh, a large crack, corrosion can be quite easy to find and characterize. Fatigue and creep are a little bit more difficult to detect and characterize. Um, so often we need to be able to um, make an evaluation of fatigue and creep damage using some um, alternative techniques uh, based on some collected data and some evaluation mechanisms. So there are methods available for characterizing the effects of all of these different types of damage uh, on the materials resistance to loading. There are um, various standardized procedures out there for characterizing whether or not um, areas of damage will um, lead to uh, a failure in a component. Uh, these are typically called fitness for service procedures and they deal with these types of damage in different ways. Thanks. So, so as I've mentioned, Different types of damage can be detected using different types of non-destructive um, inspection techniques, but also using condition monitoring, um, we are able to somewhat identify whether or not these, um, these damage mechanisms are appearing in our components and in our materials. Um, sometimes by comparing a, a delta from one day to the next, if we find that vibrations have changed, if we find that acoustic emissions uh, have changed, um, that it might indicate the presence of a growing crack. Um, and then it may be a case that uh, a more rigorous 
inspection um, technique is needed to actually characterize that, the, the, the size of that crack and how fast it's growing. But we can use condition monitoring to be able to identify if strains are changing, if vibrations are changing, temperatures are changing, and so on. And we can use that alongside other information that we can collect to make an uh, evaluation as to whether or not our damage is um, becoming uh, problematic. So there's a range of methods, as I say, and each of those is going to have all sorts of different advantages and disadvantages, and uh, depending on the application, depending on how accessible the component is, um, what the environment uh, is uh, of operation and how easy it is to conduct that type of um, inspection uh, and monitoring techniques. So it's really important that, um, and again, this isn't the topic of this webinar, but that we apply the right techniques to make sure that we are maximizing the amount of data that we can collect, um, but also that the data that we collect um, is has minimized uncertainty uh, and maximized applicability um, so that we can then use that data in a, in a sort of robust evaluation of um, the, the damage that may be being accumulated in our component. Thanks. Obviously, mechanical testing um, plays a huge role in understanding whether or not materials are um, resistant to particular types of damage. Um, so testing with engineering materials um, on the small scale or on the large scale uh, under different environmental conditions, uh, potentially with some uh, pre-introduced um, areas of damage um, is really important for understanding materials resistances and allows us to make a, a full evaluation as to whether or not there's a, a risk of failure under a certain combination of um, environmental conditions, uh, mechanical loading, um, and uh, damage. Um, so we need to understand these material resistances. They're, they're typically uh, only really able to be de determined using physical testing uh, in the lab. Um, this isn't something that can be technically simulated, um, although we can make inferences. Uh, we can do clever things nowadays with microscope modeling and potentially um, use um, developing techniques in machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to make inferences and extrapolations as to how a material might respond and it might fail under a certain level of um, uh, a certain configuration of environment and loading. Um, but really, we, we will never know the true failure potential of a material unless we actually physically test it. Um, that's, 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 that's the current state of play. Thanks, Richard. So there are, as I say, things that we can do uh, to try to help us with engineering um, decision making regarding the, the acceptability of materials to continue, continue in service um, using modeling and simulation techniques. So these might be things such as using finite element analysis to determine very complex stress distributions um, that occur throughout life and throughout all the different types of loading transients um, that might be seen in a component. Um, whether it's sort of very, very significant thermal stresses in a transient, um, significant mechanical input um, pressures, uh, system loadings, uh, and so on, and how these all might combine to develop very complicated stress states in a complicated geometry throughout life. We can then also identify how those complex stress states um, interact with levels of damage within a component to determine the driving forces associated with that damage and how that damage might evolve over time if we get a good understanding as to what the growth rates of um, areas of damage might be from physical testing, we might be able to evaluate how damage might propagate over time. We can simulate residual stresses, perhaps from a welding process, um, and identify the, the potential for residual stresses within a component to affect the uh, progression of damage over time. And as well also simulate things such as how we might, if we found an area of damage, how might we repair that component um, and what would be the effect on 
continued operation of that component B um, and how would that change the levels of stress that we might see in the component over time and, and things like beyond design basis events as well. So things that weren't taken into account in the original design, how might say an earthquake or, or, so, or, or so on affect um, the, the local driving forces um, around a damaged component and affect the potential for failure of that. So taking all this into account, if we can do all this using modeling and simulation techniques, can we actually build up digital twins of um, our, our, our material or our component or our system to help us with a sort of a real time evaluation of our uh, materials component passport? Thanks. Thanks, Richard. So a brief run through of some of the challenges here to effectively quantifying uh, materials degradation. Okay. So we have complex materials potentially are increasingly being used in industry applications, um, including metallic welds that are not homogenous in terms of their response. Um, they potentially have unknown material properties and resistances that are very complicated to test accurately for um, and also to characterize um, for use in an engineering evaluation. Um, we potentially have much more complicated design geometries and in operating configurations and operating environments that can be very difficult to construct and suitable test rigs for and to replicate the actual behavior that the component will see in service. And materials have a significant amount of scatter in their materials properties and resistances. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty there as to how we actually treat the materials resistance data in an engineering evaluation as well. Thanks. Um, there's all sorts of problems related to actual in-service exposure um, to uh, complicated environments, especially those we don't know a great deal about yet and how what their impact is on uh, typical engineering materials. Um, there's a great desire to use hydrogen more in the future, um, and it has only been recently um, uh, investigated in, in, in great detail as to what the hydrogen effects on materials degradation are um, in certain, certain scenarios, although it is a very complex um, um, a degradation mechanism. There's a range of different hydrogen degradation mechanisms, and this is, these are really only being um, experimented with and evaluated uh, in, in the last last couple of decades, really, and still not very well understood. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole range of different inspection techniques and methods for characterizing these areas of damage. Um, but for new materials, new environments, and so on, these uh, may not be very well refined. And there may as well be accessibility issues. So inspection may be very challenging, um, which obviously means that if we cannot do um, direct inspection and non-destructive testing, can we rely more on condition monitoring to be able to give us the data um, that we need to be able to make good evaluations as to whether or not uh, there's uh, too much damage in our structures. And we also have problems with demonstrating in-service fitness, fitness to service um, in the presence of complicated areas of damage in complicated geometries where the materials and the, the resistances uh, may not be sufficiently well understood. Thanks. So how could we use um, simulation and digital twin techniques supported by condition monitoring to assist with all of this? So very brief, briefly run through the types of techniques that are available to us. Um, we're familiar with deterministic analysis uh, and that this is um, usually the, the bedrock of engineering analysis where we have some understanding of uh, a particular input to, to an engineering problem, whether that might be a temperature, a stress, um, a level of damage. Um, we can feed all that into a, a calculation and that tells us whether or not that component is safe to continue operating. And there's a high level of um, conservatism built into those types of calculations because we need confidence that we've got a very high level of um, safety margin built into that calculation 
to ensure that in the, the rare events that something goes slightly outside of expectation in terms of the level of stress or the temperature or the level of damage hasn't been characterized very well. Um, that even even if there is a significant outliers in, in, the, in the inputs that we feed into our calculation, that we still is a very low risk of failure occurring. But this deterministic analysis so is very pessimistic, uh, but it does tell us potentially if there are issues that need to be dealt with regarding um, the operational environments um, or a particular level of damage in a component. So there is a significant amount of family conservatism there inherent in a lot of the data that we feed into these um, assessments. Moving on to probabilistic analysis where we can take advantage of uh, a much better understanding of the uncertainty associated in that data. Um, but we need a lot more data. We need the data to understand what the spread of um, the, the distributions might be. Um, so whether um, so, for example, we might be looking at um, corrosion rates in a particular um, application and the corrosion rates can be variable and they will be dependent on a range of different, um, uh, different environmental parameters. Uh, but if we can get a sort of reasonable distribution as to what the expected corrosion rates might be, we can make a probabilistic assessment as to uh, what we might expect in terms of a, a corrosion defect propagating. Um, and make an evaluation as to whether or not there's a, there's a risk of that corrosion defect getting too large and to be able to let, allow the component to withstand um, the applied loadings. So the, the probabilistic analysis tells us probabilities of failure associated with our, with our inputs and our evaluations of materials resistance and gives us a, a, an understanding as to the level of risk in the component and then based on that level of risk we can help make decisions as to whether or not uh, we've got a good appetite for risk um, or a low appetite for risk if we're a bit more conservative um, and make decisions accordingly as to whether or not we continue to operate. Yeah. And this type of analysis can feed into risk and reliability type analyses where if we know what the consequences of failure might be and the probabilities of failure um, using our um, so the probabilistic analysis. These can be very powerful tools in identifying what our priority should be for maintenance um, and optimization of our um, asset integrity management um, uh, program. So where we've got very limited or uncertain data, um, these types of approaches um, where we sort of track and prioritize um, issues to do with our plan might offer a route to sort of increased confidence and optimized um, decision making. So we need to collect and analyze recent operational inspection and condition monitoring data um, that allows appropriate trending calculations to be performed and, that, and then we can make informed decisions based on that. Thanks. So if we have small scale test data, um, from to, to, to quantify materials resistances and so on. Uh, we can de develop materials performance models uh, for use in modeling and simulation. But testing can be very challenging, especially if you have very complex worldments um, that have uh, significant uncertainty. As so if you want test one day on a, on a given worldment, you may end up with a completely different uh, material property the next day, um, often depending on the the position that you test in the worldman, um, that there's a significant um, inhomogeneity in the in the worldman. Um, very harsh environments um, and the effect of the environments on materials degradation and resistance uh, will be very complicated um, to, to understand as well because it will be a function of a range of different um, uh, issues as well. So if there was a way to try and try and understand all of these different effects, um, the effects of fabrication, the effects of environment, and so on. Um, if we could simulate all of that, recognizing the uncertainties and the scatter associated with all those different processes, there may be a way to um, simulate the, the results of materials properties, although obviously it will still be associated with quite a significant amount of uncertainty uh, because of the inherent uncertainty in the, in the inputs to those processes. So there is a role for machine learning and 
artificial intelligence in, in, in estimating data sets. Um, but uh, th this is this is something that it really is still under development and it still needs a whole lot of validation associated with that. So just just su summarizing that point really, we, we, we need to gather a whole lot of data uh, about in service operation um, to be able to make any kind of decision really. Um, condition monitoring plays a big role in gathering this data, um, especially in situations where non-destructive inspection is too costly or impossible to actually achieve because of accessibility issues and so on. So we can actually use condition monitoring data, um, strains, vibrations, temperatures, and so on to feed into um, what might be termed a digital twin um, and make decisions based on real-time evaluation as to what the condition monitoring data is telling us um, about potential for degradation of materials. Um, so th there is a huge challenge here with, with data acquisition, storage, and, and use. Um, the more data that we can collect, the better, obviously. The more data that we've got access to, the more decisions that we can make. But as we get more data, it becomes much more cumbersome. And we're going to need to uh, apply some very strict and robust data analytics to that data to make sure that we're using it in the most appropriate way um, and we are not missing anything. And as more and more data becomes available, and the, the potential for human error uh, and human factors related issues becomes uh, much bigger. Um, so there is, again, uh, a role for automation um, and machine learning in processing uh, that data and making decisions based on those huge data sets. Thanks. So digital twins, um, I'm not going to dwell too much on what a digital twin is, but it's, it's, it, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But at its essence, it's a mathematical model of a system. Um, and obviously, we've been doing mathematical modeling of systems and components for a long time. Uh, but given that computational resources are a lot cheaper nowadays, and we have access to a great deal more computing power, We've got new modeling techniques available to us. We've got much more data from condition monitoring and instrumentation. Um, it is becoming much more feasible um, to develop something that is a lot closer to a real-time evaluation of um, a, a system, which is what a digital twin should be, uh, as close to real-time uh, twin of the current state of a, a component or an assembly. Thanks. And how does that differ from most models that we have typically used in engineering analysis in the past? Um, as I mentioned, we, we want it to be as close to real time as possible, rather than taking a snapshot from an inspection that was done, say, a month ago and feeding that into an engineering analysis. We want to be having something uh, that is continuously running and using data from continuously uh, that is being continuously used to monitor um, the state of a component and assembly, um, and it should be computationally efficient enough such that it is effectively tracking that uh, monitoring um, and using that data and almost immediately providing decisions um, regarding the current state of, of equipment such that um, plant engineers can then make decisions about what to do regarding maintenance or continued operation. Um, so, as I mentioned right at the beginning, all this needs to be in a fairly unambiguous format. We need it to work in a way that the decision making is unambiguous and it explains why that decision has been made based on a certain level of damage that's been found or inferred based on the data that's been collected. So, it needs to be unambiguous to allow engineers to make um, reasoned arguments about uh, operation and maintenance. Thanks. Um, there's a whole range of stages to digital twin development, as you might imagine, in terms of validation, monitoring and review and continued improvement. Um, so we won't dwell on this slide too much. Um, it, it, this will be available, uh, this set of slides, but um, there's a whole range of different tasks that go into developing a successful digital twin uh, and continuously updating it to make sure it's still um, valid.
what's really important in the digital twin is having a robust, simple model to uh, transfer data from condition monitoring techniques, um, such as temperatures, pressures, and so on, into the, the outputs that we require to make decisions. So those outputs might be slightly remote from the areas where we are taking the uh, measurements. So if we're taking temperature, pressure measurements, um, upstream in a system, and we actually want to identify a critical location as to how damaged that location is getting because that location is actually inaccessible um, to in inspection or condition monitoring. We need to be, have a robust, simple model for um, transferring the results of the upstream data to the downstream um, critical location. So what we need is something called a reduce order model uh, which is based on all the same engineering principles that we would use to conduct engineering analysis in the past, but allows us to make very quick, snappy decisions um, as to the, um, the expected uh, state of a, um, of a material or a, 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 a component at a particular location. So there's all sorts of different reduced order models, and we use them all the time as engineers. Um, most engineering calculations um, that, that we do are a form of reduced order model, and we're, we're simplifying systems and um, physical processes down to something that can be um, easily calculable using sort of closed form equations and so on. Um, but there are ways that we can make this um, simpler um, or, or more complicated, um, depending on our access to numerical um, compet computational power. Um, we can provide much more data related to the local environment, um, provide data related to the current state of the component, and that can all feed through into a, a transfer function between the inputs uh, and, the, and the required outputs, whether that might be sort of um, damage that's been found within that is expected to be found within the component. So, the the most suitable um, type of reduced order model for this type of approach for a digital twin is really um, the black box approach, uh, where you feed in some data and outcomes uh, a, a decision at the end. Okay. And really, yeah, this is just saying that we can feed a lot of data into our model, um, including validation data and third party knowledge and so on, and that feeds through into our model. Um, so the engineering understanding that feeds into these models are, is still key to the development of high quality digital twins. It needs to have some kind of engineering judgment and informed judgment behind it to make a reasoned argument uh, because we can through all the input data and engineering equations at some things we want to, but there still is a, ro a role for human engineering judgment in here to make uh, robust and suitable models uh, for digital twins. Okay. So back to the, our heat exchanger example. Um, as I say, the, the, there are things that cr happen during operation of a heat exchanger that lead to fluctuations in pressures and temperatures uh, across the whole heat exchanger. Different locations will see different um, um, changes in temperature, different fluctuations in pressure and temperature that can lead to local problems, um, potentially fatigue and cracking and so on. So th these aren't things that we could analyze necessarily um, using um, the expected design conditions that feed into a simple FEA analysis and then pull out stresses and so on. And from that, the, these are things that would need to be tracked at a local level using fluctuations in local temperatures and local pressures, um, uh, uh, fluid distribution and so on. So there, there is a role here for localized condition monitoring and looking at the impact of that on the potential for evaluation of damage. Thanks. So historically, what would we have done um, to identify if there's um, if, if a component or assembly is safe? Rob, Rob just to like say we're Rob, sorry, I know, just we, to say we're at quarter to the speak, hour, speak. so uh, crack on. Thank a you. Bit. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, yeah, we just got a couple of slides left, so thank you. Um, so 
typically we would have gone through a process of um, analyzing a component's um, thermal profile and the response to that thermal profile and the mechanical stresses that result. Um, and then use those stresses and sort of worst case conditions to identify whether that component was a threat of failure. Um, but this only really works when you can analyze one or two static conditions. Um, it's obviously a very lengthy process to build a finite element model. Um, we don't want to be doing this every time we encounter a new condition or encounter a new level of damage in a component and identify whether or not that component is safe. So what can we do instead? What we want is our reduced order model, um, where we effectively um, build a series of analysis, probably parameterized uh, version of the finite element model, and identify what the effect on the local stresses might be as, as a result of a combination of temperatures in, say, uh, different adjoining tubes in a heat exchanger. What effect does that have on local stresses? So we can start to build our transfer functions between local temperatures and the local stresses in a system that can then feed through into uh, an evaluation of fatigue damage. Thanks, Richard. So if we can track operating ex uh, temperature data from our various adjoining tubes in a heat exchanger, we've got our transfer function from our reduced order model, turn that into some form of fluctuating stress and fluctuating stress can then be fed into um, whatever form of fatigue evaluation that we want to, whether we want to use some sort of SN curve to identify fatigue damage over time, um, we can do that. Um, this whole process then takes of once you've got the once you've collected the temperature data, we can then um, feed that all that through all that through into the calculations and come out with an evaluation of progressing fatigue damage in, in minutes rather than sort of the days, the weeks it might take to evaluate several different configurations in a, in a finite element analysis. Thanks. So just speeding through a summary now, um, we, can, we can assess the number of fatigue cycles from that data and we can predict what the tube sheet, the various components in the ease exchanger, um, predict the damage across that, across that assembly. And those real-time predictions allow us to provide provide decisions on um, uh, interventions, maintenance, increased or reduced inspection intervals, and whether or not we want to take this heat exchanger somewhere else in the future. So the digital twin types of techniques can be used in scenario planning as well. So if we wanted to say uh, to come up with some what-if scenarios, like what might be the effect of changing um, temperature in, in out the temperatures uh, and so on. How many additional startups might be um, achieved or um, sacrificed um, by, by doing that? So there's a range of different applications for digital twins in terms of what if planning as well. Um, and having these access to these really realistic damage predictions allows a significant increase in reusing and decommissioning that plant for some, some other application. Thanks, Richard. So just a very brief summary then of the whole talk. Um, there's obviously a still a range of challenges in engineering decision making, um, especially with access to new and exciting engineering materials, um, new and exciting inspection and condition monitoring techniques, um, and uh, the drive to try to uh, reduce environmental footprint um, associated with our engineering activities. And there's not often the time, money, or ability to be able to characterize materials performance in a way that would allow us to um, conduct sort of historically um, what we would term to be deterministic structural assessments. So we need to do something a bit quicker and a bit faster and a bit more effective. So data analytics is going to have a huge role to play in demonstrating that in-service components do the job and are also fit for reuse once their job is done. And that data analytics is going to heavily rely on accurate um, and um, condi accurate condition monitoring data that has very limited uh, uncertainty associated with it. Thank you. So just very briefly about digital twins, they're, they're very computationally efficient. Um, they're going to effectively be, allow us to make real, real time um, decisions about how our components will behave in the future. And it will allow us to make a lot of decisions around 
um, changes in operation, um, decisions around maintenance for our asset management type programs. Um, and it's important to note that this is a, a continuous process. It's not a one-off um, tool. We, we need continuous development of the digital twin to take reference of new uh, data, new feedback from users um, regarding what they've seen uh, in a qualitative sense. So the underlying all of this is reduced order models. We need to make sure that our, our transfer functions, our reduced order models are actually um, correctly um, uh, just describing what's going on in the system. So there's a whole range of different uh, types of models that we can choose from, but we need to make sure that um, the, the data that we are selecting and the, the functions that we are using are most accurately describing what's going on in terms of the physical processes. Thank you. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, that, that took uh, I was obviously talking for a lot longer than I expected to there, but we have got 10 minutes. Um, so I'll hand back to Richard, who might have picked up some questions as in the chat as we go along. I have just, um, thanks Rob. Just, I'll, I'll flick through a couple of slides and then we can just finish off with questions and hopefully um, we won't run out of time. You can look um, on YouTube, you can find we've got a whole bunch of webinar recordings, just a few examples. There's lots, lots more of them um, to do with all sorts of technical topics, including condition monitoring. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Certificate errors, fantastic. Um, I'm not going to link those. We also, um, we have a seminar coming up in September. We, we ran this last year as well at the University of Manchester. It was very successful. It was almost a talking chop with a lot of industrial engineers there talking with each other interacting with the presenters and i think everybody went along had, had a good time and you won't find cheaper seminars than we put on this is only 40 quid we're only covering our basic costs we're not out to make any profit everyone's volunteers so if you want to come along register for that and then just while we're answering the questions i'll leave this slide up because if you want a cpd certificate or if you want to give some feedback there's some email addresses there. I'll just leave it up while we go to questions. Perhaps um, if Thanos and Simon can also pop up their, their, um, their video um, feeds from their cameras. I've got, um, the, you can probably all see the questions in the Q&A already. I asked a couple, but I think we should start off with someone, someone else. So we've got, this question, how do you think leak detection repair technologies can contribute to a more reliable facility? Is leakage data relevant to condition monitoring? And it actually go, let's ask, do that bit first and there's a second half to the question. So yeah. uh, I don't know who wants I, I to answer that. That, that, that is an interesting question. No, I think, um, I think in my experience, leak detection has often been a, a way of identifying um, when there is a, a bit of a, a margin in between um, find, finding a chat, finding a problem such as a, a sort of a crack in a system, and when that when that crack might lead to an eventual failure, um, you probably wouldn't want to be uh, in a system where you were continuously leaking, um, because apart aside from the fact that that is um, probably not very operationally efficient. Um, it, it sort of signifies that the the end is coming. Um, so having leak detection equipment is is really great. Um, I think I think having I think I think you could probably term uh, leak detection equipment as condition monitoring um, equipment um, because it is effectively monitoring what the state of the the equipment is. I.e., there is a an unexpected leak here, so there is obviously a a crack of some kind, and as that leak, those leak rates increase. That is, I, uh, that is implying that there is a change in the system as well as, as the crack grows, for example, or a, a gasket is loose or something like that. Um, okay. So um, think, okay, let's just uh, move on because we have got a few questions. So, yeah, sure. Uh, just the second half of that question, do you think the UK energy industry, energy industry is open to adhering to new technologies such as quantitative optimal gas imaging, which I know nothing about? Well, I was just going to say, I, I don't know much about that either, to be honest. Um, but I'm sure that if there were a, um, if quantitative optical gas imaging, I'm, I'm just imagining what that might that might be. Um, but if it, if it were able to characterize 
um, the leak rates and the, the potential for identifying how cracks are growing or, or leakages in the system are developing, I, I don't see why why the energy industry wouldn't be um, so, uh, bringing that forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, and another question: What complex systems have you implemented this uh, integrated digital twin solution to? What sort of things? Um, so one of our biggest examples of where we've actually implemented this ourselves as a company is into gas turbines. Um, so industrial gas turbines that see a whole range of different um, temperatures um, and, and stresses and strains across the gas turbines in operation. Um, they, get, they get to very high temperatures, uh, very high loadings. Um, and in different parts of the system, they will be subject to significant strains. So this can be really useful, and this has been really useful in identifying critical parts of the gas turbine um, system that needs to be monitored further uh, and inspected for, for potential damage. There's, there's two or three questions about regulators. I, I put one or two in, and Simon has as well. I, I'll sort of start off with my one because I think it sort of sort of includes that. So in the UK, would health and safety executive accept these techniques as an allowed demonstration, as low as reasonably practical, in other words, for, for fitness for service? Because I've been asked question on coma sites, how, how long do we have we got with this before we have to start worrying about it? Yeah, it, it is, I, think, I think it's evolving. So I think in terms of the HSE um, and, and potentially other regulators, they, they would, uh, as long as it can be demonstrated that robust physical engineering arguments have been implemented in the design of these models and these applications, um, I think the regulators are very pragmatic in the UK and will um, accept good engineering argument as long as it's I got a good I, basis. And I've done some of this, and it is really down to the quality of your evidence, your references, and the assumptions, so they can at least challenge them. It's not they don't, they don't want to accept a black box. <laughs> We'll yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and what are what are the challenges and best practices for applications of those ROMs um, to support safety cases? Uh, well, I guess we sort of covered that, haven't we? A little yeah. bit. In the, in, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Who else have we got? Um, right. There's. I'm, I'm conscious I haven't really involved Simon and. Uh, so there's another question how there's a lot about uncertainty and in and inaccuracy in the outputs from condition monitoring methods how do you take those into account in the subsequent analysis because if you have a you know standard deviation and then you use it for something else and then you introduce a, a, another standard deviation before you know it are you becoming completely inaccurate. Indeed, and I think, yeah, I think this goes back a little bit to what I was talking about with probabilistic analysis. So we, we recognize that there are significant uncertainties in a lot of data. And e even when we're, even when we're doing a simple sort of analysis of things like corrosion rates and so on, recognize that there's a lot that can vary um, depending on the application. So we always have a lot of uncertainty in engineering calculations of this type. And if we can, if we can quantify that uncertainty in the spread of data, um, building those probabilistic arguments, um, probabilities of failure associated with particular events and the consequences of those events, that 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 tells us a lot. Um, and if we have high probabilities of failure based on a spread of data, um, then uh, the, we've got a lot of uncertainty. That 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 certainly tells us something. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And then I'm just going to throw in one final question and then, and then have to close the webinar, sorry. And, and if you haven't asked your question or haven't had it answered, using the feedback form or Murat's email address, we'll get back to you afterwards if you want to continue this conversation. The final question was, this was almost, I thought the material passports were a way of sort of life extension and reuse because i couldn't imagine trying to reuse a heat exchanger rather than scrapping it i'd have always scrapped it in the past you should suggest well, indeed it, indeed it, it I, I, think, I think probably uh, yeah I'm, I'm probably exaggerating a little with the the, the potential for reusing parts of the heat exchanger but you, you could you could see as as we get 
as we get better understanding of damage accumulation in all these different parts, um, and we get a better understanding as to how these materials might be reused, where we previously in the past were quite pessimistic about what could be reused out of an assembly, we might have a better justification for doing so in the future, as a lot of this, a lot of this data that we're accumulating comes online and we can make better decisions with it. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not something that's done regularly, but um, that, that, that is the concept behind the materials and component passporting is how can we how could we use elements of this elsewhere? OK, I think I'm going to have to call a halt to that. I've just put Robert's um, slide up with his email address. If anybody wants to talk to him directly, robert.colker at element.com. Uh, thank you very much, Robert. Very interesting. Thank you. Some good quality Thanks, everybody, questions. For, um, for and being here. I'm sure this is this has got a long way to go. So um thanks to everybody that was involved. And again, if you want more events, just let us know and we'll try and lay them on for you. Okay. Thanks all. Bye everyone. Take care. Bye.